Hey there guys, welcome back to Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you my final review for Stargate SG-1. And in this case, it's going to be my review for seasons 9 and 10 and the sequel film, The Ark of Truth. The reason I'm doing all of these together is because it all entirely deals with the, or for the most part deals with the Ori story arc. They have the ball story arc thrown in a little bit here and there. So I'm going to get that out of the way first and then jump into my review for the Ori. So the second sequel Stargate film continuum deals with getting rid of the final Gould system lord ball. Um, so technically, for continuity, the film continue should be watched after season 10, but if you watch it like I did after season 8, then seasons 9 and 10 kind of deal with the fallout for the rest of the clones that Ball had um, made of himself, so... I, for me, I didn't really feel like it was any particular. There's any particular reason to watch Continuum before season nine or after season ten. So, for me, if you watch it like I did after season eight, then with the balls in season nine and ten are the remaining clones that um, SG One was unable to find, but did turn up from time to time throughout. Uh, in the universe, and basically Ball had made a lot more clones than, they th than Stargate Command had thought, so it kind of still works for me, so watching in this way is not really a big deal, but if you want to um, make it kind of like a full stop on the Gould story arc, then uh, watching it after Season 10 makes sense, but for me, before Season 9 or after Season 10 works just as well. So with that out of the way... Um, as far as the Stargate Ori story arc goes, um, it's a kind of a matter of convenience, but the Ori rose to prominence in their own galaxy, and by being able to build a super gate, they're able to come into the Milky Way galaxy to try and convert everyone in that um, galaxy. And initially, it turns into a matter of a new race of beings, in this case, the evil version of the Ancients or the Ascended um, ancients being able to or trying to impose their will on the galaxy and using their powers as ancients to quote put them make them gods or make people perceive them as gods um of course the jaffa and the humans think know the errors in false gods and people pretending to be gods with their full war um with full on war when um conversion from the gould so they of course are hesitant and it um, becomes a story arc where they need to find a way to defeat the Ori. And while the whole story arc with Merlin and Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table kind of felt far fetched and out there, it was kind of along the or it wasn't too far gone when you consider it in um, perspective with the Gould pretending to be Egyptian gods and the pyramids being spaceships coming from. Um, or alien, or the, the pyramids are alien spaceships coming from other galaxies. So, um, essentially, it's not that far out, and it all comes back to the idea that the ancients or the Alterans, essentially, as they were coming to the end of life for their race, um, essentially seeded the galaxy with humans so that they could live on and populate on their own timetable, rather than. And, rather than um, die out as a race, which is what happened with the Asgard, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But when you watch the seasons, you see that the Alterans, through their um, idea of non-interference, is one of those things where they don't want people to evolve um, artificially beyond their abilities so that mistakes are made and um, races are... Um, killed off or they affect the galaxy as a whole and it kind of goes back to some of the themes they brought in throughout the first eight seasons of episode notably with the Jonas Quinn story arc um, but also with some of the other um, races in the first few episodes or first few seasons so um, overall the Ori story arc was good and my initial thought process with the Ori was that it was kind of rushed um, so I was kind of hoping that, and I still feel that it's kind of rushed to see them 
uh, rise to prominence and, the, and then defeated in two seasons and a uh, movie, whereas we spent eight seasons on the Gould and maybe a couple seasons with maybe a few seasons with the Replicators, but um, that kind of worked for me. The Replicators story arc worked for me just because it was a transition into that and then their ultimate defeat. And the, they had we had the benefit of the Asgard already working on trying to defeat them, so overall that all worked for me, but when you spend eight seasons trying to defeat the Gould and then you have a more powerful race like the Ori defeated in two seasons, um, it kind of felt rushed. Granted, we had the... Um, we had Stargate Command and our SG-1 looking for Merlin's weapon and knowing about it right off the bat. So it was kind of the, a whole Hail Mary to defeat them. But I kind of hoped in watching it now that we would have had more time with the rise of the Ori in their own galaxy. To see more of um, how they rose, why they were cast out, and just more history on the Ancients. So... I, to me, I think one more season, maybe two, I think two would be stretching it, but one more season with the rise of the Ori would have worked better so that we could see um, more of what's going on. So kind of after season nine where we have um, an Ori coming through or we have the team finding or on this quest for Merlin's device to defeat the Ori, having translated some root... Um, ruins um in their galaxy to find out that the ori exists and they're in another they were banished to another galaxy so one of those things where you know in season nine it deals with the rise of the ori and sg1 finding the tablets to not necessarily merlin's device but a tablet of some or some sort of ruined civilization even on atlantis to say that the ori were banished and then 10 and 11 would be about the ori building the super gate and coming to our galaxy and their um, overwhelming powers, and then um, see the events of season ten are moved into um, season eleven, and we finish that story arc there, and keeps the film for the arc of truth as is. That kind of would have worked for me, so it just felt like it was kind of. So I still feel it was kind of rushed, and things were missing, but they did. Um, wrap it up nicely so it's one of those things where one more season with the rise of the ori in their galaxy outside of being ascended beings would have made for a more complete story arc rather than a sudden rise um in their powers and then suddenly showing up so kind of along the lines of the gould where they show up in the star original stargate film and then they come through the stargate in season one and we build upon that so it was kind of just, I just kind of wanted more building up to, um, the, um, Ori. So one of those things where it was, it was kind of rushed, but a little bit more, but it, it wasn't poorly done, but it still feels kind of rushed because it would have been nice to have one more season with that price. So that's all there is for that review. And the other thing that did feel kind of rushed was the transfer of the Asgard, um knowledge base into the um databanks of i forget if it's the prometheus or the odyssey the human ship because the asgard finally realized that they're dying off but i kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time with the asgard um with sg1 trying to figure out how to um, save them or at least more time than all um oh, okay we're finally dying off so we're giving you our um knowledge database i mean it fits in with what the or how the asgard do thing but i kind of wanted a little bit more than just a transfer of power in the series finale so but that's just a nitpick on my end so nothing special there but i kind of wanted a little bit more there um they did bring that up throughout the whole asgard story arc so it kind of fit but like most things with um stargate su1 i always wanted to get a little bit more with that so Overall, um, watching Stargate SG-1 now um, is a good series. I I um, like it as a whole, so I definitely recommend watching it and using the um, recommended episode um, site on GateWorld to watch um, the key episodes. So I will say that, yes, there are a lot of one-off episodes and individuals. 
uh, random stories that they tell. There's very few story arcs that I, and not to say that they're bad episodes, but I mean, the, with, you know, 22 or 22 to 25 episodes per season, you are going to have episodes that don't really count, but the key episodes work for the Gould, Gould, Asgard, and Ori story arcs. Um, but if you are a completionist, I mean, I want to say that'll take about a year to watch every single episode. If you do, you know, one episode a day, so. There are a lot of episodes, but overall it's a good show. Um, and things like, and a couple of things stood out this time for me. So, starting in season one, you do start with a four by three aspect ratio somewhere. I think around season five or six, it goes to 16 by nine. I think it isn't until the final two seasons where we get it in HD. So, um, you get to see that progression this time around. And one of the things that stood out to me this time as well that I kind of liked was the idea of equality between every between the cast in the show so you do see while you have colonel o'neill for and i'm going to do the simple example of colonel o'neill versus um captain carter is that they're both in the military but o'neill understands her value and you see a lot of a lot of it brought up when you're watching the series that you have gender equality and uh, recognition that males and females are equal and that um, no one is better or worse than anybody else. So one of the things I liked was Colonel O'Neill acknowledging um, Carter's intelligence. And you do see her promoted through the show from captain to major to colonel. So I did like that. And I mean, you have, for example, um, Daniel Jackson acknowledging why Carter would not be promoted to um, the head of SG-1 when, during the time when they're trying to take down whoever was stealing all the Asgard and alien technologies and all that. So even though it was a ruse, it was nice to see that you have people standing up for everyone else, and it's not and even towards the end of the season when you have Carter acknowledging with Ball that Ball is giving her a hard time because she's human and a female and he acknowledges that it's a bit of both so you kind of see you get that theme throughout the series and even for example with Dr. Fraser you have her being the head scientist in the SGC so it's one of those things where these roles could have just as easily been placed in or been cast with male characters but they have you know the smartest female scientist and the smartest female doctor or smartest scientist and the smartest doctor being female characters and then for example when they replace dr fraser they replace her with another female character um and then you have for example among the system lords you have female system lords so it's one of those things where um and even with the ori story arc you have the aura side being a female character so Granted, the priors are all male, but you have them being led by a female um, character. So things like that stand out when you're watching it, watching the show this time around. So that's all there is for this particular review. So um, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or anything like that, you can find me on Twitter at PatelN01. The website's PatelN01.com for past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. And of course, if you're a patron, then you um, already have the news for some up exciting um, changes coming to the show in the next couple of weeks. So look out for that um, on the public feed. But of course, if you help support the show, then you get that um you get early access to content like that and more, so um, be sure to support the show there. Um, but that is all for this particular review. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.